Namaste and good evening. I, Chavi Jain, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam, Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI, hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a panel discussion on disaster resilience, special planning, perspectives on local and regional governance and impact. This discussion is a part of the series, Hashtag Local Governance, organized by IMPRI, Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies. I would now like to introduce our panelists for today, Dr. Nivedita Haran, who is former additional chief secretary, government of Kerala, Dr. Divya Sharma, who is executive director at Climate Group Delhi, and Vidushruti Sadhukhan, who is Senior Program Coordinator at ICLE South Asia. We are beyond honored to have you all with us, ma'am. And finally, we have Professor Tathagata Chatterjee, Professor of Urban Planning and Governance at Xavier University, Bhubaneswar. Thank you for joining us, sir. Our discussion for today is Aravind Unni, who is thematic lead for urban poverty at Indo Global Social Service Society, Delhi. Welcome, you, sir. We are also pleased to have with us Mr. Tikender Singh Panwar as the moderator for today. Sir is a former deputy mayor of Shimla and a visiting senior fellow at IMPRI. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Shavi, for uh, that introduction. Sajun, shall we start? Yes, please, sir. Good morning. Uh, well, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining uh, this discussion. And uh, uh, as we all know, today is the International Day for uh, Disaster Risk Reduction. And uh, uh, this year, uh, the theme for 20, uh, 2021 edition is focusing on the international cooperation for developing countries. <laughs> Uh, to reduce their disaster risk and disaster losses. I, I again reiterate, I mean, it's for the developing countries. For the, uh, There may be uh, many reasons, but I think one of the reasons uh, uh, that uh, is very pertinent here to mention is that between 1970 and 2019, more than 91% of the deaths attributed to climate change and weather-related disasters were reported in the developing countries. So I think there's a lot, lot more that has to be done uh, especially in the world in which uh, we are living. Uh, so, uh, and and uh, uh, we are also aware uh, very soon, uh, uh, in, in, it's a matter of a few weeks that COP26 will begin. Uh, but there we will be talking more about mitigation strategies. I think uh, what this day specifically mentioned uh, is about uh, uh, more to do with the, uh, uh, with, with the strategies for adapting so that the loss to the livelihoods and to, uh, to, the, to lives is uh, uh, actually reduced. And we have seen actually uh, just in 2020 in India, I and mean, I don't want to bring in the international context here, but uh, we lost nearly 2,067 lives uh, just because of floods. And uh, uh, if you see the cumulative figure, of 15 most destructive events. Uh, so there's a report that nearly $150 uh, billion dollars were uh, 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 were lost in, in, in 2020. And of course, 2021, the losses are still um, uh, uh, adding to it. Uh, the point is that if, uh, um, this, this day, uh, when we talk about uh, adapting uh, and, uh, uh, and strategies to uh, meet up these challenges, I think some of the most important aspects is, and, and of course, also not, not to forget and not to add that 75% uh, of the districts uh, in India are actually considered to be extreme hotspots uh, as far as their vulnerability is concerned. And this is about 638 uh, million people living in uh, in these 75% uh, districts. So, so, so we can easily understand that the vulnerability is extremely high. The point is that the problem is why we are we are actually uh, 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 building this discussion is that we started from the Sendai framework and the Sendai framework actually focused on uh, measuring 
some of the vulnerabilities in the cities. Shruti, I remember, uh, was part of uh, the team that did uh, this exercise in Simla, and we had many of those exercises. So what we what we intend to do through this discussion is uh, that. I mean, where are the challenges? A, I think the first challenge, first and foremost challenge is that we do not even have the measure. We do not even know what is exactly the vulnerability. And that's why uh, we can see the, uh, the phenomenal amount of uh, number of deaths that takes place. Of It's not that if, if, you, if you count the 10 largest disasters that have taken uh, place in 2021, uh, maybe one or two comes uh, uh, to the developing world. But despite that, the, 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 the loss uh, of the lives is actually extremely high. So there is some problem, actually. There is some problem, A, in, in actually mapping those, those risks, those vulnerabilities. B, once we map it, actually, who's, what is to be done? I mean, uh, are we able to mainstream, uh, if, if, even if we have uh, uh, been able to map those vulnerabilities? Because we've seen in so many cities that uh, we have uh, the hazard risk vulnerability assessment. We just saw in Simla, a full six-story building actually sliding down. So, uh, so what is it? I mean, where is the problem? And who takes the call? Because we have the National Disaster Management Plan, then we have uh, the State Disaster Management Plan, we have the District Disaster, and of course the City Disaster Management Plan of Actions, but actually uh, the CDM is not even ratified. So, uh, so even if the, when we decide where is the, where, where does the problem lie? I think all those issues uh, probably in the given time frame, we just need to discuss those. And uh, so that A, we are able to um, assess, B, we are able to build the capacities of our people, and C, we are able to reduce, actually, human lives must not be lost, uh, just because when they can be protected, then they can be saved. I think um, uh, with these words, I, uh, I just uh, need to start uh, this discussion, and Professor Patagasa, um, uh, I would like you, sir, to come in and just explain the overall picture of uh, of why this day is very relevant, and not just going going by the tokenism of the day, but I think more than that, uh, what is important is what needs to be done. <clears throat> uh, thank you uh, uh, so much for the uh, very relevant uh, uh, introduction, um, and um, you know, I mean. Suddenly, you know, it appears to me that suddenly, you know, in the last two years, we have uh, the entire country have woken up to the uh, issue of disaster. Uh, but I mean, the we had been uh, facing disaster for the past several years uh, due to the climate change impact, but very few uh, steps had been taken to address this. And now as the COVID crisis has uh, happened, uh, suddenly the issue of uh, disaster has um, come to the front pages. Um, and um, the urban areas um, are, uh, you know, I mean, the most vulnerable uh, uh, in the COVID context, I mean, worldwide, uh, the cities had accounted for over 95% of the COVID um, cases. But also the uh, in India, the coastal mega cities are also, uh, the coastal cities in general are also facing severe climate change threat and um, uh, Asian Development Bank report who several years ago had highlighted that point. Uh, but not much uh, action uh, had uh, happened. And so when it comes to the issue of uh, uh, urban resilience, so we need to understand what we mean by uh, urban resilience. You know, I mean, urban resilience is defined as a, a measurable ability of any urban systems with its inhabitants to maintain continuity through all shocks and stresses while positively adapting and transforming towards sustainability. So uh, the, uh, a goal of uh, major goal of resilience is to move towards uh, sustainability. And here comes the issue of sustainability for whom and sustainability for what? Uh, the critical question here is that um, disaster is not uniform. And as we have seen, particularly in the case of COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, particularly the early days, 
um, the impact of disaster had been highly desequalizing and um, again it, it has brought out uh, most vividly in the urban areas due to the um, crisis uh, faced by the migrant workers uh, in so many of the uh, cities and um, and uh, again i mean um, it was not the end of the ordeal many people walked uh, hundreds of kilometers to reach home, but again, after the, uh, the situation opened up, they again had to return back to the uh, cities. And again, when the second round of disaster happened, um, many of them again uh, had to return back. So, I think I mean there are very few uh, states in India which had responded to the COVID crisis uh, in um, um, in a sustainable uh, manner. Kerala uh, particularly, I mean, uh, has been the leading state in addressing the livelihood vulnerabilities of the uh, people. Um, uh, the way uh, it rose to the occasion in a very short period of time, um, to address the uh, multiple vulnerabilities faced by the uh, migrant workers from different uh, parts of the country. But, uh, here in Odisha also, Odisha government have, I mean, had been on the other end of the spectrum. Is that, I mean, Odisha is not a migrant receiving state, but rather, you know, I mean, it's a state which sends out large numbers of migrants. So uh, Odisha has also come out with certain uh, uh, programs to address the livelihood uh, needs of the uh, urban poor. And the urban poor had been at the most receiving ed, uh, uh, end of the uh, disaster. And not just the COVID, it is the uh, flood crisis or um, uh, the uh, urban uh, heating. So it is the uh, urban poor, the informal sector, uh, who uh, bears the uh, burn, and here comes uh, specifically the role of the uh, role of special planning. So, what is the what do we want our special plans to uh, come out with? Is it a plan for only a half of the city, or the plan needs to uh, embrace? Uh, the largest sections of the city. And another uh, crucial issue point here is that there is a huge data gap. You know, I mean, we had not been able to uh, map what is the precise size of the uh, informal sector. We, we do not know when what is, I mean, we all know that the urban informal sector hugely contributes to the city economy, but we don't know what is the quantum of it. Uh, no city, I think, has a, a database about uh, its uh, informal uh, sector population or uh, slum population. I think we need to have a much, the disaster resilience, we need to have a disaster, focus on disaster resilience, right? But also the disaster resilience uh, focus needs to uh, focus more specifically on the issues of uh, urban poverty and uh, associated risks and many of these risks are actually magnified due to the deficiencies of special planning, uh, which actively makes large sections of the people um, uh, informal. So, Professor, so, uh, Professor Tadagata, if, if, I, if, if I may ask you, because uh, I think this is a very pertinent point that you mentioned, that special planning is so very important, you know, <laughs> though we have some of the experts now in the present government who are saying just dump uh, the planning process in the dustbin. I mean, we've, we've heard uh, Sanyal saying so, and is even Kabuzia throwing Kabuzia and you know the SPA is into the dustbin. Actually, I don't buy that argument for the for the. But I think, but there is still some problem with the with the, with the entire planning process. So when you when you've been pointing out this spatial planning issue, uh, yeah. and so where is uh, where where is the problem, and, and and what needs to be to be brought in? I I, I I I think one. A major problem issue in special planning in India that it has for a very long time focused exclusively on, you know, I mean, land use categorization. 
ஒருத்தர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ
um, and I would not be exaggerating it that whenever we talk about resilience and climate change, we we do talk about infrastructure development, but we kind of have projectified disaster risk reduction rather than talking about the broader implication of badly designed cities. Um, and just to start with what constitutes vulnerability to disasters. And of course, people are central to vulnerability to climate change, no doubt about it. But where does the problem arise? The problem arise that people do not own their city. And that is the starting of the problem, the tip of the iceberg. The vulnerability is also driven by bad planning or the lack of it. Vulnerability is driven by uh, city systems and how they are designed to function. It is driven by governance mechanism. And of course, how inclusive these cities are meant to be. And uh, I'm sure uh, the people will discuss about inclusion, but I would keep myself to only um, planning uh, today. Second point that I wanted to make was that we have highly underrated our institutional mechanism to planning. For example, town and country planning organization, development authorities are highly underrated. We come up with a very huge, very promising scheme like smart cities, but we choose the smart city plans to be made and developed by consultants, sometimes even international consultants who have no context so, so to say ever to Indian cities, let alone the regional context of the cities that they very you know nicely set out to plan uh, under the smart city scheme. It was a huge potential time in the, in the history of urban planning in India, the smart cities project or, or the scheme itself to build the capacity of town and country planning organization, the institution like development authority to get to the next level, which we, which we completely missed. Then, so, so we just lost that opportunity to empower development authorities. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was that our URDPFI guidelines, which are guidelines or the Bible for urban planning, they were revised at one point of time around bringing regional perspective to urban planning. And it is very important when we talk about disaster risk resilience to bring regional perspective, particularly to see how urban areas talk with the rural areas and the in-between buffer systems and peri-urban and urban fringes, particularly because of the people who reside in urban fringes, particularly because of the ecosystem functions that happen between urban and rural areas that highly you know, drive how the disaster would impact that particular city or pointers in city. Um, we've always unfortunately superimposed climate concerns and environmental concerns to our city systems and spatial planning has quite differently been taken all this while. There was a paper that I wrote as early as 2010 about mainstreaming climate resilience in development planning mechanism. And it included both planning, urban planning, as well as urban management. But unfortunately, so much work has been done, but we've not got to the crooks of the problem as yet. And this is very, you know, uh, um, disheartening, so to say. Um, the third point that I wanted to make was around, um, and yes, I just want to give one example of a project that we did in Vishakhapatnam city to look at how sea level rise will impact the city. And the solution was to, to come up with an infrastructure inventory for the city, just to say what are those critical infrastructures that the city would need to keep operating or to make them resilient when a disaster strikes. So Vizek is a city at the east coast of India, highly prone to tsunami and storm surges. But we found that there was no, you know, there was nothing that was thought of when these infrastructures were, you know, located in some of the very critically hotspot areas of the city itself. And there is no way these big infrastructure are designed and, you know, implemented, projects are implemented in the city and then removed because we see that city, sea level is rising or disasters are hitting these infrastructure again and again, leads to so much loss and damage, so much loss and damage, not only of life and livelihood, but also infrastructure that was built with public money and which will remain and is designed for 100 years to come, which is amazing. The other thing, and uh, um, I will, if you have any question, I, I'll put, but you see, 
the way cities are perceived and infrastructure is developed unfortunately the the path or the route we are taking is towards place making and not uh, towards infrastructure resilience infrastructure has to be meant for better mobility for better functionality for quality of life for social cohesion for mm -hmm. economic development place making on this other hand could influence microclimate it could influence beautification it could definitely influence quality of life and sometimes could social cohesion these two have to be married together to make inclusive functional disaster resilient cities so these are broadly my point that i wanted to make but i'm happy for any questions that you yeah have. i think i think i have uh, because i think your first point was very important that people should own uh, the city but we have seen actually you know this ownership is also a very dialectical process in the sense uh, we have seen in the master plan 2041 and arvind was actually part of that campaign uh, actually there was a deliberate attempt to ensure that the people do not participate in this in that process so you know what happens over the period of time that when uh, the processes are such that you eliminate the people then the ownership uh, the sense of ownership also gets diminished and you know i want to bring in uh, lefebre here i mean who says they want right to the city and when he speaks about right to the city it is actually uh, uh, i mean the right across to planning i mean, I mean that's what what he is focusing on so how do you find it i mean if, if that and and of course right to the city it doesn't just mean uh, i mean how 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 you to shape the the town or your city but also i mean uh, taking into a climate change perspective so what do you think is important uh, uh, i mean it's, it's it's a brilliant question and i might not have the full answer to what you are saying but see we are dealing with the complexities of urban functionality over here and how cities operate and who these cities are built for so if i am uh, developing a sagarmati river front what was the idea who would use it and why so these are the specific questions that need to be taken care of when i was working in assam and smaller cities of assam around flood resilience uh, we were in dibrugarh and majoli and you know smaller towns of that sort and we went and we asked people about what problems do they face when flooding occurs and the first thing and the first response that we got out of that interview was that but we do want floods floods are important for us oh. so we do rise and we we do paddy we have paddy fields the problem is that the construction that is happening the way these our, our cities are developing are not only hindering us to do our you know traditional agricultural practices but also floods in in the you know in our houses and cities so we are completely disregarding how our nature interacts with the constructed or human planning yeah. and which is very important and i completely agree because i talked about complexity and how to bring people that is where representatives of people leadership that represent people comes into picture which is again very weak in our system one leader might emerge but that is, you know, it will be I just um, it will not be a norm you know unfortunately it is thanks lavia Uh, uh, Dr. Nivedita, actually, I uh, brought in this disruption. Actually, you were uh, supposed to speak after Professor Tathagata, but deliberately I asked Devya to speak uh, after Professor Tathagata, so that we just have a view of uh, uh, some concrete cities. And now over to you, Dr. Nivedita, because you uh, worked in the government, and uh, you know one of the senior most posts uh, in the government where you shape things. Uh, where uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, you've been part of those uh, state disaster management plan of actions, and uh, of course, not not to speak about your state because your state is way ahead as far as the planning process is concerned. But overall, I mean, when you speak about Jenin, of course, you can bring in those Kerala kind of experiences as well. Uh, what do you think is is uh, uh, is is important in the in the present context uh, when we talk about spatial planning? and to reduce our uh, uh, i mean to bring in the entire concept of drr <laughs> thank you thank you chairperson uh, no when uh, when you uh, i think i assume that there must be some uh, rationality behind the disruption and therefore i i wasn't very surprised uh, but thank you for uh, inviting me to speak 
Uh, greetings to all of you on this day of disaster resilient resilience building. Uh, when you talk of disaster resilience spatial planning and in modern times, I think uh, we are very lucky that we are living in times where technology has, has shown us ways of doing things which we had never dreamt of before. If you are an architect or a, or a civil engineer or even, a, even an administrator, uh, the kind of things that technology allows us to do now uh, is amazing. And I say this uh, from the point of view of spatial planning and spatial mapping, uh, because things that, that took almost maybe uh, three days to map earlier can now be done in 10 minutes. So geospatial planning is very, very is a, is a very important tool in our hands now. And it's most pertinent uh, in the sector of disaster preparedness and disaster resilience building. Why so? Let me, uh, what does the geospatial planning do that can really help in disaster resilience building, disaster preparedness, uh, planning our cities, et cetera? Let me uh, list a few of them. Uh, first, it helps us to place locations with pinpoint accuracy, such accuracy that uh, it's difficult to uh, challenge it or to ignore it. Second, it does it with coordinates, which means that you and I may be there, you and I may not be there, but those coordinates will always enable posterity to fix that location with as much accuracy as before. So whether it is a location of, of the flow of a river or uh, the, the, the roads passing through a village, it is now, uh, nobody can challenge that. Nobody can say that, no, the river was actually, this was the course of the river earlier because the data will show what was the case and not what, what, what one thinks was the case. And thirdly, uh, with the availability of uh, AI and BDA and all these te uh, technical tools, uh, it is one of the easiest and quickest way of uh, pointing out connectivity, availability, and suitability. So you see, decision makers can now take advantage of uh, GPS planning and GPS mapping in a manner that was unheard of even 25, 30 years back when I was a collector, for instance. Now, let me also hasten to add that a lot of this data, GPS accurate data, which I mentioned, just mentioned, is already available. It is available in the, in the context of land management. It is available in the police department on the location of the police stations. Uh, it is uh, available in health department uh, where it is already known. Uh, they have already mapped uh, where the hospitals and health centers are located, schools, etc. So what the first speaker mentioned, professor mentioned about the data gaps are. I don't think there is a data gap as such. The gap really lies in using the data, sharing the data and using the data. Why do I say that? I say this and I want to give an example and mention this, that uh, sometime about uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, we had a severe uh, boat tragedy in Kerala, in Munar, in a place in the hilly station of Munar, near Munar. And the biggest problem at that point for us was to get first uh, focus lights, floodlights, and second, boats. The easiest and quickest way we could get boats and floodlights. And what really helped us was the GPS maps that were available, which showed the location of where the floodlights were available in the nearest police station, in the nearest municipal uh, office, or where the boats were available. So you see, it is one of the best tools that is available now for good decision-making processes. And same thing holds for even more complicated uh, equipment like choppers and uh, ambulances, road 
earth movers and so on, which are all required when there is a major disaster. Uh, vulnerability, and I would like to share this with you. Uh, you know, one of the best uh, equations that defines vulnerability, explains vulnerability is the following, which I've uh, come across. Vulner vulnerability is equal to inequality into poverty, of course, divided by awareness plus capacity. Now, if you see each of the factors in this equation have to be handled at the lowest possible level. It cannot be done at the national level or at the state level. It can be discussed, it can be collated, uh, it can be prepared and put into uh, reports. But if you wish to improve the awareness level, you have to do it at the local level, at the, at the panchayat level, at the municipal level, at the ward level, in fact. If you want to improve the capacity of the people in uh, protecting themselves and facing a disaster, it'll have to be at the grassroots level. Uh, one of the models I want to mention to you, which was started in Kerala and uh, which uh, then spread to other states also, is what is called the task force models. What was done in, under that uh, model was very simple. At the lowest level, so whether it is the ward or the panchayat, or the municipal level. That's the, that's the maximum we went up to. Uh, what was done was task forces were set up and these task forces were supposed to be attending to the following. Not just when a disaster happened, post-disaster, but also uh, for resilience building. One, medical services. Two, community shelters. Three, the special problems related to the vulnerable sections, especially children, uh, senior citizens, women, etc. And fourth, dissemination of information. We found that nothing could do, nobody could do the dissemination of information better than these task forces, because they were right at the local level and they knew at the, at the grassroots level, and they knew who needed what information, regardless of, you know, rather than spreading information widely, they knew how to target the information sharing. Now, what are the problems in this? Uh, why is it that we still continue to talk about lack of urban planning or not, uh, not abiding by urban plans and so on, as the previous speakers mentioned? Let me quickly list the problems that come to my mind and that, that I think should be our target areas. One, the lack of interdepartmental and interagency coordination. We are a society where we refuse to share information and share data, not because we are willfully uh, wanting not to share, but because we feel that, uh, share, why should we share? You know, the, the need to share whatever data that we have should be inbuilt in our psyche. So whether it is the mapping of uh, our roads and rivers, whether it is the location of our public services, whether it is the location of our offices, that should all be shareable. And that holds even for the private sector, private hospitals, private availability of uh, 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 experts, expertise, nurses, doctors, that data should be shared, which is not unfortunately shared. Second, we have this problem of lack of delegating. You know, we again, at every level, and I am seeing it not, I have seen it ad nauseum in the government, and I'm seeing it at the non, in the non-government organizations these days. It is always an empire building. We would not like to we, there's a resistance towards delegating authority. We have to learn to delegate. And the more we delegate in disasters and disaster management, better will the management be. I can, I can tell you with 100% guarantee. Thirdly, within the local bodies, uh, unfortunately, and uh, that should not be the case, uh, you know, when the Panchayati Raj institutions were thought about, they were supposed to be apolitical. 
at least after the elections were over, they were supposed to be apolitical. But somehow they have become extremely politicized. And to the extent that if something is to be done at a certain, in a certain area, in a certain ward, uh, if the mayor happens to be from a certain political party, he would choose a ward where he has won, his, his uh, party members have won. I think we have to overlook that. In disaster management, there can be no politics and definitely no politicking. That's out of question. Fourth, uh, like everywhere else, petty corruption uh, and disasters are most prone to corruption for various reasons. You know, less questions are asked, the, the, uh, the funds are often not audited properly. There are, and a lot of things can, uh, can be done without asking, following too many procedures and uh, questions being raised. But one has to understand that questions are not raised and procedures are simplified in disaster management because time is of essence. You cannot afford to do things after going through the whole process of taking orders and getting things approved. And therefore, delegation and delegated powers doesn't mean misusing those powers. And finally, uh, when we talk of urban planning, uh, I think uh, the previous speaker mentioned about plans failing and how smart city has failed. Smart city has failed because of us and not because of the people who were planning it. And of course, they are also responsible, but it's because of us. We need an exception. We want everything to be done as we wish. That is not how a plan works. A plan is prepared, approved after required discussion, and then it is to be implemented and enforced. It cannot be based on exceptions. And what comes to mind, and especially seeing that the chairperson at, in today's uh, discussion is from Himachal, I cannot but mention the, the orders of the Apex Court, which came sometime in the early 2000s. Uh, on how planning has to be at the grassroots level and how exceptions cannot be permitted and how public servants have to ensure that anything they do are doing it with a sense of public service and with a sense of uh, uh, public responsibility. Uh, anyone who wants can look those up, Justice Kuldeep Singh's uh, orders uh, on uh, on these areas, on on protection of water bodies, on protection of uh, rivers, river flows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So urban planning is very good, but it is as good as we make it out to be, and that is what has happened. I know in Urissa they have come up with some very good plans on uh, management and and rehabilitation of slum dwellers, and uh, I was dealing with them uh, off and on, and I thought that. What they are doing is very good, but often the, the support from the public, uh, from, the, from the larger community is lacking. And that I think is probably the trage tragedy of all that we do. We have to get together and we have to um, ensure that when something is done, it is done with due consideration and with due seriousness and uh, a, a sense of, um, you know, a sense of uh, togetherness which often is lacking. I think I've taken enough time. No, so thank, thank you to thank the that, 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 that was interesting, uh, Dr. Nevedita, and in fact, bringing in the perspective of, uh, of provincial government, you know, how our provincial government functions. But yeah, I think you've mentioned uh, some of the uh, important aspects as far as tools are concerned, as far as technology is concerned. Uh, well, we'll discuss that. I, th I think probably Arvind will uh, speak about that because that is also an important aspect. How good is good? Uh, how good is uh, good data? Yeah. So probably later we can we can talk about that. But thank you, Dr. Nivedita, for really pointing out those four five uh, important points, and uh, uh, I think what also needs to be done. Uh, uh, I think we'll take a question later on, maybe once uh, uh, we have it from from the participants here. So over to you, Shruti, if I can see you, and. Uh, 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 what I think you, uh, because uh, Ikle is a very large network of cities where cities actually join uh, this membership. And uh, Ikle has also been responsible to uh, uh, 
preparing a large number of uh, city plans, uh, measuring the greenhouse gas emission inventories, uh, even measuring hazardous vulnerability assessments. So you know quite a lot about you know the complexity of uh, the system, how it functions. Uh, so apart from speaking about what you've been doing, and actually in some of the good case studies, actually what is the complexity that needs to be addressed? I think that is more important today when we speak about uh, on DRR, and uh, maybe maybe we could create that space for uh, for, for for more discussion. Maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Tikenderji. I actually uh, was thinking that I should mention uh, about the problems that, that, I mean, there are a range of issues that municipalities are facing uh, when it comes to disaster risk reduction. And um, I mean, our previous speakers have been talking about some of them. Nivedita ji mentioned a range of issues that the government in general is facing. I will try to focus on what the municipalities, the local governments, uh, generally the urban municipalities that I'm working with actually, uh, the kind of issues that I see uh, in these places. So I think the first thing that, uh, that we see is the uh, capacity level. Uh, not, not to say that nobody knows anything, they are really highly qualified engineers in the uh, cities, but then they are not really planners. And uh, we haven't actually come across cities which have a very strong planning department, which, uh, which can actually bring together different departments. Like Nivedata, you was mentioning, there is the interdepartmental uh, coordination is lacking that we have seen in every city that we work with. Uh, to the extent that uh, population data, something as, as simple as population data, which, which we would assume that it is just based on census data, even that is uh, sometimes different in different departments. So everybody is following a different uh, population data to do their planning. So, I mean, it's kind of amazing how that can happen in a city. But uh, yeah, that, that's there. I mean. The technical knowledge, even if it is there, the ability to link that technical knowledge to uh, you know, disaster management, to things like uh, sustainable development goals, to think like climate resilience, uh, these are all upcoming issues, right? They are not, these things were not there 20 years ago when people had started working. And, uh, and they're always changing, it's, it's always uh, developing. So these, these, the ability to link these issues, it's very uh, rare that we see it in municipalities. Uh, then there is the thing about uh, technically knowing how to conduct a vulnerability assessment, risk assessment. We don't expect that there would be obviously, uh, you know, trained scientists within a municipality, that's not possible, but they need to know where to go. If you want a data on vulnerability, if you want a data on risk, where do you go? Who can give you? And there are people who are doing these studies, which is their job to do. And then even within their cities, all the cities have universities, all the cities have their science departments and environment departments. Uh, these universities can provide this information. There are people who are uh, researching on these issues. You can always easily reach out to these issues. Nowadays, actually, even government has come up with good reports and they can be used in the absence of, uh, you know, locally uh, localized information. So if you don't have local level vulnerability reports, at least you have a regional report which you can access. So these are the things which you need to be able to do and they don't know how to do this. So I mean, it's not uh, it's not that they don't want to do it, but it's uh, something that you need to be able to process the data. Just just looking at the data is not enough. You need to be able to analyze the data and then use it in your work. So that's uh, that uh, link is missing. There is an issue about jurisdictional limitations when it comes to disaster management. Disasters generally managed by the district governments are responsible. Municipalities will do what they are told to do, and uh, they're not really directly responsible for managing the disasters. So it's not often that you will see a full-fledged city development, uh, city disaster management plan, which is there. There are cities who are developing it now because they're repeatedly facing disasters. So they, they are realizing that this is important and they have started working on these things, but it's not common. It's not everywhere that you will find this. And then you might find disaster uh, management plans for one particular disaster, not for everything. 
So you might have a heat resilience plan, but not really a flood resilience plan. So all these things need to be integrated and that there should be something which is common that the city can use actually. Um, and lastly, I think there is also a problem about accessing finance. I mean, even if you do have a plan, you need to implement it. How do you implement it? So there is, I mean, it's not to say that there is uh, not enough commitment. There is, of course, enough commitment for climate disasters. Um, but then there is a limited flow to the local governments, to the cities at least. They cannot directly access funds from international sources. They have to go through national government nodal entities and so on, which is not a problem. The problem is preparing the technically strong proposal to actually go through that uh, process. So because they do not know the, uh, know the linkages between climate change and urban development or SDGs and urban development, so to be able to access the funds which are related to climate change and to make the urban development sustainable and resilient, they will, they will not know how to do this. So, um, and, and then that also comes from a, uh, from a need of data. Uh, like you were mentioning, we have developed uh, climate inventories for several cities now. And every time we do that, we have to collect this data from a range of different departments and this brings us back to our interdepartmental coordination, which is lacking in the cities. And so it's basically a cycle which goes on and on and on. And unless you actually uh, try, try to address several parts of these uh, problems together, it's very difficult to manage. So Shruti, this I is- have, I have yeah. a question to you. Actually, yeah. uh, what we have seen is, uh, especially with the smart cities, you know, as you're pointing out that you require a scientist, a climatologist, a geologist, and a hydrologist, definitely. But what we are witnessing is because of the push for uh, the, the infrastructure and what Devya was mentioning, you very rightly mentioned, uh, you know, what we have done is, and I can tell you, I mean, there is a congruency between urban flooding in the recent past and the, uh, uh, the smart cities. Wherever these smart cities infrastructure projects are being constructed, you find urban flooding, actually, which was even unheard of in some of some of these towns earlier. So, uh, so what needs to be done? Because there are reports. But the point is, I can understand. I can even disagree with the who prepared. Even if some the report is like not too good, but there is a report, okay. But then who owns that report? Because every time you go again, you have another report because. You know, that report doesn't actually go into the consciousness of the people, doesn't catch their imagination. And the authorities actually go back to square one and they work with their own tools. I mean, I mean the, the, the kind of tools that they have uh, through their own wisdom and what they've been doing on I mean, convention in the past. How do you break this? How do you bring this disruption so that, you know, hey, there is a document. There is something like here. Please follow that. Let's not do this in the future. So. What, what should be done? I mean, because, or, or has any city been able to do it? This is, um, this is something that we have been trying to do. And this is something that we have been telling cities to do for a long, long time. It's extremely difficult for various reasons. Corruption, like Nivedita ji mentioned, is one. But there are also other reasons. You know, political uh, uh, priorities change. Um, people's understanding change. So once the power changes, then the understanding changes. So three years you're working on a particular issue, you come up with a brilliant report, and then the next uh, government comes in and their priorities are completely different. And then that is shelved and something new is going to be worked on. So it's, it's, it's extremely difficult. What, what we as ICLE try to do is to uh, see that whatever plans that we make, for one thing, we try to get the municipalities to talk to stakeholders. Uh, we tell them that you need to form a stakeholder group. I, I, we, we don't care who you invite, but it needs to have certain categories of people. So there has to be somebody from the universities, there has to be people from the private sector, has to be people from NGOs, communities, etc. So we have a range of uh, uh, people that we need to include whenever we are having these kind of planning discussions. Uh, we, when we help them make their climate resilience plans, we tell them that 
we will not work with only the only your environment department there's one person sitting in the environment department that's not it's not possible for him to do the entire job mm -hmm. it's not uh, also right because climate change is a cross cutting issue how can that person solve everybody's uh, problems and the other departments will not follow the plan so the, what is the point of making this kind of a plan so what we tell them is that we need to form a, a core team within the municipality, which includes different departments and uh, not the heads of the department because they never have time. So uh, we always try for a middle level person who will actually sit and then uh, not very junior also because then he won't have a clout, but uh, trying to bring a balance between the seniority level and the ability to actually take things forward to do some work. So uh, this kind of a thing, we, we try to make these institutions within the municipality. And uh, what we tell them is that anything, any data which is collected, any um, report that is made, everything needs to be passed by these uh, committees and everything needs to be vetted by them. So whatever data is um, uh, presented to them, they need to agree that, okay, yes, this is what we will be following. This is uh, okay, this is acceptable for the city. Uh, so that's something that we try to do. We try to uh, encourage them to be more inclusive in their processes. So we have uh, ground level meetings, like board level meetings and so on, when we are, particularly when we are trying to do, you know, pilots in the city. Uh, there we try to engage the community to the maximum extent possible. So uh, those kind of things we try to engage with women. Uh, with any other urban poor people, the migrants, etc., like slum dwellers and so on, try to engage with them regularly. And uh, because like ICLE works with the municipalities on an ongoing basis, we, it's not really project-based uh, relationship with the municipalities. So what we basically tell them is that, you know, your uh, our project is for three years, but we are going to be there with you forever. So uh, that way we try to build the relation with the cities also so that they can trust us. And we have uh, been able to do that with several cities in India actually. And uh, they are understanding the, the technical support that we can provide them. So they can they understand that we can actually link their projects when, when they want to do a climate related activity or some, some data that the government is asking for, which is climate related and they don't know what to do with it. They actually come to us. They come to us saying that, you know, help us with this. So uh, we try to do that. We provide these kind of, we have some simple tools which the government uh, officials can actually uh, use. And uh, not just for this inclusion mechanism, but also for, you know, integrating the different sectors. How, how do you actually engage with the different sectors? How do you analyze them? What is the... Uh, what is the problems that each sector might be facing, say, because of climate change that is happening um, or will happen in the next 20 years? How are you, if you're going to invest in your water supply uh, um, mechanism, then how do you make that resilient? So if you're going to put in uh, 100 rupees in this, if you can just add 10 rupees more and make it 110 and you make it resilient, so that's worth it. That's put that 10 rupees. So that's well, one, of, one, of, one, of, one of the projects, uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, put it on record. In fact, uh, there's a researcher who's doing uh, work in, in Simla. And, you know, it was a situation between the city government, and of course, I was the deputy mayor at the time in the declare, rejuvenation of water, uh, water natural sources. And it's, uh, yeah. actually, it's one of the uh, most important uh, interventions that we were able to do. The small fund that we got from Ikle, yeah. and then of course with, uh, with lots of things, yeah. Mm. So, so even if when when we yeah, have, so have water supply, so you know there is the natural source and it was contaminated, but now because of this intervention, now the people get yeah. So thank you, yeah. thank you, Shruti. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I think you. that that is some of the areas where we can really intervene more for decentralized, for more for empowering people. Arvind, now over to you. But the three points that I want to. Uh, what you read is apart from the overall discussion that you've heard uh, and uh, you know uh, what do you bring out of it a you remember when we were going to the school of planning architecture because i was uh, a guide to i think the 50 year students and i took urban road so long and what both of us we we made them do i mean probably they will be cursing us all all through our lives because this was uh, uh, yeah they, they were very young students and they had to do a project on homeless and the moment we saw the first draft, it was like 
uh, I won't say horrific, but it was like quite scary because the entire terminology was they and us. So, you know, they who are homeless and us who are planners. And apparently that is true for our planners. In fact, the way we are planning cities, they do not know how to move about in a bus. You know, uh, who are homeless in formal sector. That doesn't mean that only the informal, I mean, someone who's in the informal sector will design and plan. That's not the point. The point is, and then we made them actually stay 24 hours in a homeless shelter. They stayed there, uh, those students, and they were one of the finest reports that they could have. So this is actually true because, you know, the Paris Institute are uh, preparing the development plans of the city. Right. A, it's neither political, answerable to the political establishment, uh, nor is it engaging with the people, as uh, Professor Tha also mentioned, and then we have heard uh, Dr. Nivedita also. So, what do you do in, in such a situation? How do how do people reclaim their rights? You know, I mean, right. what uh, what Devi was saying, uh, you know, they should own the people. Two, at a very macro level, what do you do in such a situation? Take the example. Because of the large glass capital around the world, you know the kind of typologies we've built. If you just go in, uh, go to Delhi, I mean, I mean, in, 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 I mean, I've been quoting this Lady Harding Medical College. You see the old Lady Harding Medical College, where you have a maternity ward without that sustains without an air, air conditioning facility. But you have a modern building with those all those glass typologies, where you cannot survive even for a minute without the air conditioning. You know, so. So, you know, this push for glass typology, and now after COVID pandemic, we are realizing it's a disaster that has happened. So probably we'll be revisiting our architects, our designers will be revisiting those designs. Uh, what I want, to, I don't know, what, I mean, what I want you to speak about is, I mean, what do you do in such a such, such situations? Or as Romy and all have been saying, let's go back to the basics, you know, let even planning be done by our, uh, our local institutions and uh, quite at the ground level, they are more sustainable. And uh, I actually laugh at times, you know, because of the looming power crisis. What if we do not have fuel at home? What if you, what if, you, what if you're sent to sign? Well, I mean, I'm also, I'm, these are funny questions, but I think these are important questions. Right. When we speak about them. So yeah, over to you, please. Go ahead. Right. Uh, Tikinderji, I think uh, my opinion on, on, let's say, both of these questions would, would actually be that one, uh, reclaiming is very important because the way uh, our cities are being done, uh, development plans. So one one point that I would like. So I'll make the point and then give you give you examples. So one reclaiming is absolutely important because planning is a very powerful tool, very useful tool. Like uh, the way Nivedita was was also mentioning, but the fact is that that it that tool. And that and that usefulness that usefulness of that tool is 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 being used by uh, by 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 a certain section, and a huge majority in in our cities are not not able to engage with that tool. So the, that usefulness usually because it's done in our cities, which is the cities of global south, that usefulness actually backfires. And the way you have our cities, the the way we have right now is partly the, the result of a very powerful tool at the hands or with, in the hands of, of wrong set of people, institutions, agencies, so on and so forth. One example of that is that even after, as we are nearing 75 years and we have already started the celebrations, uh, I think the latest Niti Aayog report says that, that around 60% uh, of our cities do not have plans or have outdated plans, point number one. Uh, point number two is that that on the contrary of seeing planning as 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 uh, apolitical, we people who engage with plan because we work on on development plans in cities and with communities, we want to bring back the politics in the plan. So let it be contested, uh, and politics not not the the party politics, but the politics of you know where is our share. Where is our share to resources? Where is our share to land? Where is our share on the road? Uh, so on and so forth. So those are the things that we want to bring back into the discourse. And we are doing it step by step. We don't know how far or how long that will take. 
but that is the attempt or that is the direction that we are that we are moving in uh, so that was my my response to uh, in short my response to the questions that you posed um, i would want to just start uh, and and give a couple of examples before you know posing a few questions mostly because we engage not from a disaster management perspective but especially after a lot of what has happened in the last one and a half years during covid even though igss as an organization has a, a drr but it used to mostly focus on rural i am absolutely handling urban issues and i am a practitioner so i'm 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 coming in with that perspective so three three four instances of what really shook me up at least personally on what could be done with uh, disaster risk resilience and how do we adapt as we go forward one look at wave number uh, one that we had in our cities all the migrants were were kind of moving away from the city for for very obvious reasons that and very obvious and strong reasons that they had the only place that they we could accommodate them were homeless shelters that were already crowded the shelters that the government does not want to invest in anymore but they didn't have any other options so they are they they packed all the migrants in those homeless shelters but when you have a master plan debate which you are having right now in delhi again you see that dda is not interested in making shelters and and you know is 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 fine with with that number because we think that covid was a rarity and it just happened to be a huge disaster it might not happen again in life so why why bother second covid wave 2 uh, yeah uh, what we saw in wave 2 in delhi and many other cities and and sometimes we saw that you know smart city control rooms were being used for uh, monitoring so on and so forth that's all i feel uh, one way of kind of diverting the attention from the real issue the fact is that at least when i was in delhi for 15 days i couldn't see any government <laughs> local city or national i mean uh, all 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 were one or all none were present right so so that is where we really have to think of how do we use the community strength that we have because at that point it was only the communities that were working point number 3 is that delhi now just has a draft master plan that's being done and what you see is in terms of disaster risk management or response uh, you only have two three things one is that you have a reservation for a dis, uh, disaster management unit which is for every 5 lakh population you will have a unit second you have a disaster management center at a national at a at a city level it really misses the bus or like doesn't see the elephant in the room or, or 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 all around us it doesn't bring the disaster discourse closer to the climate crisis that we are facing and for a plan that's being done for the next 20 years huh? when we are actually debating of 1.5 degree 2 degree and how do we control it in the next 3 4 years you are having a 20 year old plan which does not go beyond refuge spaces or or you know little uh, references to building codes so on and so forth and that only talks about flood fire and earthquake this is the context that we are dealing with my bigger questions that we should think ask bring into practice is point number 1 is is don't see disasters now especially when you have it with climate crisis uh, uh, and and the whole equation of disaster changes is that disaster for urban working class working poor urban marginalized is daily it's a daily disaster that they have homeless when they are out on the streets and they are having to face 45 degree celsius temperatures on the street street vendors doing their work on the street uh, if they are having to face this temperature uh, on a daily basis so this is not like a covid once in a 10 year or 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 like a flood or like a fire this is a daily occurrence in their lives which has an impact on their health livelihood house lot of things that we can't even conceptualize at this stage point number 1 point number 2 is that a uh, conventional practice let it be urban planning because i come from that background or let it be disaster management and the the whole approach to uh, our cities is fundamentally flawed because we don't understand that our cities like professor tatagatha was mentioning are are majorly informal where you stay where you live where you work so on and so forth is informal right so there is a there is a hate neglect 
or uh, uh, vilify kind of a response that conventional urban practice, urban planning practice, or disaster management practice has against informality. One, they hate this because all their standards, all the building construction codes are meant for concrete buildings. They're not meant for slums, no? Uh, 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 or even the small fire tender, that design uh, is still stuck on the idea that you want a six meter through way. I mean, you can't do that in Delhi, right? So the fact that the fire tender still doesn't get in your, uh, most of the urban settlements and the fire rages on and causes what it does, but you have not thought of innovative ways of how to deal with it. You are still stuck with that six meter uh, thing that you, that you want. So hate, neglect wherever possible, hate it uh, because you're not able to deal with it and your standards don't match. And sometimes you are attacking the informality, which is the predominant mode of city in our uh, urbanization rather in our cities. You are attacking informality saying that they are reason for floods, they are reason for fires, their reason for so on and so forth. So that mode needs to change. We have to understand that unless we engage, change our standards, change our norms, change the way we look at informality, this is not going any forward. We are we are in big trouble. Last point is uh, the problem of, uh, uh, of course, we have challenges of disasters. The problem gets more furthered because of some practices of the state and as well as agencies that are completely top down. So one point of why smart cities fail is, is, is a sort of a magnification of why development plans fail. Why they fail is that they don't engage with people, communities, lived, lived, lived realities are far away and done at a city level by experts or so-called expert agencies. Now the smart city, which comes from even farther uh, uh, has partly failed because it's failed to take even the local elected representatives on board of, of, of what you need to do. So you're forcing a very top-down idea. And I completely agree to the point that I think one of our folks mentioned that unless disaster management is looked from community up, there is absolutely no way that we're going to deal with this and, and uh, uh, engage with this process. My last conclusion of, again, two, three points. Then I'll close. One is, uh, of course, mainstreaming disaster and decentralizing the response, preparedness, mitigation, so on and so forth, unless we do that. And there are there is already existing debate, I don't know from where, of how 74th constitutional amendment should be revisited. Why are you revisiting empower uh, 74th constitutional amendment to, to further decentralize and empower the ULBs to act on uh, issues of uh, disaster risk uh, adaptation and mitigation. Um, second point is I completely agree with the idea of Atmanirbhar Bharat. And Atmanirbhar Bharat in that sense is communities, community strength, because their ownership might not be for the city because the city didn't give them anything, which is why the migrants walked out, right? But communities where we work, they care for their communities, they care for their informal settlement or slum as you call it, and they're willing to fight and die for it. So I'm just kind of putting it very strongly. So we have to use our community strengths, ensure that we are working on the ideas of disaster risk resilient communities, then get to wards, then get to city, then probably imagine something at a national level. Unless we look it up, way down, that will not happen. Last uh, point from my side is look at all the vulnerable groups they all have different disasters, their different challenges and their different contexts. There'd be waste pickers, there'd be informal workers, slums. So all require different, respons require different responses. One top-down view of, of how to deal with disasters, building construction codes, uh, and number of things that you have will not work. So hence we need to definitely do a revisit if possible on all the uh, NDMA Act, I think, high time we thought about it because when it was conceptualized 15, 20 years ago, that has changed completely. We have to revisit the, the TCPO planning norms, UD, UDR, FPI guidelines, because at the moment they are not even uh, closer to uh, what we really want to do. And we are doing that through three ways. I'll close it with that one is to actually assess and IGSS and 
bunch of civil society organizations. One to really assess and capture what is the impact on the urban poor and marginalized. Because we have to really in a disaster, we have to look at the last people first and and you know get them on board, and then others would be fine. So really capture and assess how different population groups are impacted by a host of this. Uh, for disaster, and then look at look at policy change. So those were a few points that I wanted to kind of place it for you. That's okay, it. I think that, that's been um, um, very nice intervention. And uh, I cannot see any questions, uh, Arjun, in the in the question box. So um, what do you do after this, Arjun? Are you okay. there? Go to a way forward round and uh, uh, all the panelists to respond to many points which you have also raised, sir. So I think uh, we, we go by that. Mm -hmm. And for uh, Tatagata. Uh, yes. Uh, yep. Are you there, sir? Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. I think that you, you've uh, listened to uh, all the speakers and including Arvind. And uh, so uh, I know I mean, it's, it's, it's a serious challenge. And when we talk about uh, adaptive strategies and, you know, there are many things which we talk, but, uh, you know, ultimately the call is uh, taken by the government. And uh, uh, the government is still bent on, you know, quite vertical, quite top bottom approach. So what should be the way forward? I mean, I mean, though we have, we have some, some very interesting community uh, and bottom top uh, uh, interventions that we've seen, but we've also saw, uh, seen top bottom uh, approaches, for example, in Kerala, where they were able to mainstream. I mean, you go to a uh, taluk and to a district, I mean, you can find 15 layers of mapping being done, and that uh, empowerment has taken place of local bodies. So it's quite a mix mix kind of kind kind of uh, thing that 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 we are uh, uh, that we are witnessing. So. Uh, the point is that disasters are going to happen. The point is the frequency of the disasters are going to increase. The point is how do we reduce the number of, uh, of losses, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, monetary losses and the lives that we, uh, that we lose? Because this is the year for the developing world, as they say. Yeah, uh, 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 thanks again. Mm, uh, I would um, uh, cite one discussion I had with uh, Charles Correa, um, one of the, I mean, just few months before uh, he passed away. Um, so uh, I asked him about this issue. I think we all of us are I mean, looking at this issue of uh, planning and why it does not plan work. Um, so I asked him also the same question. And um, the response that he gave me, I mean, I mean, he gave me a reply. I mean, that was um, in the context actually of disaster. Uh, so um, I would like to cite that. Uh, he said, you know, I mean, how we plan, uh, it is something like, you know, I mean, when, I mean uh, we're talking about the issue of shelter and uh, disaster. So he was um, saying that, you know, I mean, it is like when people are, um, uh, dying because they do not have food. What do you give them? Do you give them food or give, do you give them a, give them a recipe book? So he said that you know, I mean, our planning is somewhat like a recipe book. Uh, but you know, I mean, from that we need to uh, turn it into uh, food which can be uh, uh, eaten uh, right away. So um, I think you know, I mean. Um, the point that um, uh, Arvind uh, mentioned is uh, very, very important. And uh, so when we uh, look at this issue of disaster management at an uh, urban local body level, um, so we need to, I mean, not, you know, not only to make disaster resilient plan, or rather, you know, I mean, making disaster resilient should be the main item of the plan. Uh, and you know, I mean, and the plan that plan needs to be at the uh, local area uh, level plan, the ward level plan, uh, the disaster resilience plan has to have a uh, ward level uh, uh, plan and 
देन इट नीड्स टू गो अप एंड लिंक अप विद हायर स्पेशल स्किल्स एंड मैनेजमेंट डिसीजन मेकिंग स्ट्रक्चर्स एंड that again you know i mean when we talk about uh, uh, planning at a ward level i think we need to look at the issue from the uh, uh, informal settlement and the slum is a disaster of this category what should happen to the slum? uh in terms of its uh, you know in mean, again most cases Uh, what we see in india that i mean one aspect of disaster is obviously the physical aspect of disaster life losses etc but its lingering impact on the livelihood is often uh, disregarded so we need to take a sustainable livelihood framework as a part and parcel of the planning process which unfortunately we don't do our planning still remains focused on the uh, physical uh, planning aspect whereas we need to look the plan from a livelihood uh, aspect and then look at the issue of how uh, physical uh, capital um, financial capital uh, etc link up uh, to uh, build on to the livelihood uh, of the people and uh, and so uh, instead of starting from the top we need to start the plan from the bottom and then go up but obviously you know i mean no city can be completely bottom up i mean even a city like i mean uh, we also need to be practical here uh, so even a city like porto alegre which is famous for its uh, uh, participatory uh, budgeting has a budget i mean half um, almost half the budget that is the trunk infrastructure that is uh, um, planned through a top down intervention whereas uh the bottom up local level infrastructure is planned through uh community level ward level uh, participatory uh, processes so i think in indian cities we need to strike a balance uh between uh, these two um, skills and um, and um, th- um, third uh, issue is that we often talk about decentralization uh, to a um, city the question here is what do we exactly mean by decentralization do we mean decentralization only in terms of administrative devolution of power from the state level to the ulb level or we mean a political decentralization so I, because i am raising this question because uh, 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 we had been discussing the issue of kerala uh and uh, bengal also uh, to an earlier extent where uh, uh, there was a large amount of political uh, decentralization from the uh, upper uh, tiers to the lower tiers whereas in uh, odisha and many other states where there had not been any election to the urban local body for last several years i mean the last the ulb is uh, had term had expired way back in 2018 even in bengal the um, ulb term had expired in 2018 and there had not been any uh, election so far so now, uh, when we talk about decentralization without political uh, accountability without uh, elections so uh, are we not you know i mean just um, doing only some kind of uh, uh, administrative uh, stepping down i think i mean we need to Uh, match that administrative stepping down with uh, uh, bottom up uh, political empowerment thank you professor uh, dr nevedita uh, your last words if you are there for the way forward the bandwidth was poor i was not hearing very clearly so i had switched off my video ah okay uh yeah i think uh, it was interesting listening to all of you and uh you know hearing what the ideas were and what was shared and knowing where it was coming from uh, but i think all of us agree that uh, the vulnerability to reduce vulnerability one has to tackle poverty yes of course that's uh, goes without saying uh, 
But at the same time, one must make sure that that attempt starts at the lower level also, at the grassroots level also. I think that is something that we all agree upon. And the second point that uh, I think all of us are agreeing upon is that uh, the planning process uh, is, uh, of course, important. But then uh, it, it has to follow the procedure and uh, has to take in the inputs from all possible stakeholders. Uh, I have to sound a word of caution here because having been part of one of the master plans of Delhi, I remember, uh, it's not often very easy or uh, very advisable uh, to take too much advice from the so-called stakeholders or the general public. Because one has, even if one does that, one has, one should know where it is coming from. Because uh, all of you familiar with Delhi would know that there are a lot of vested interests, vested interests amongst uh, all kinds of all sections of society. Uh, but one should know that you know a city, as uh, the chairperson rightly said, the city is for everyone. It is not just for. Uh, the people li living in Latin's area or the people who are living in the uh, colonies or the old city, it's for everyone, whether it is the migrants or uh, the higher classes or the lower classes, everyone, the city belongs to everyone. And therefore the input should come from all levels, all sections, and the planning should take into account all these levels. I think that is uh, most important. I Thank think you, that's Dr. what I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, the can I see? I can't see you. I hope. I'm here. Very much here. Yes. Yeah, please, please. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, very quick points. Um, I think um, Nivedita ma'am and uh, Professor Chatterjee have made my job very easy. But I will still you know, like to stick to the, the topic that was given to me in terms of planning and how. in uh, See. The one point that I want to make again is that land use planning, the way we do it, as well as infrastructure, has a lot to do with the impact of disasters on city systems as well as its, its people. There is no denying the fact. And therefore, when we talk about disaster resilience, we will have to actually go back to the basics. I completely agree with the point that Nivedita Ji had made earlier about um, institutional silos. So way forward would be that we should look at a way to break institutional silos. We should not look at city as a water resource department, as a road department, as a PHED, you know, uh, and, and a planning department or a development authority. But how do all these together build a sustainable, resilient, functional city, which is up for economic development for the citizens of that city and give them a good life. And when I say that, mainstreaming some of these issues like climate change impacts, like disaster resilience uh, and, and others, even social, social cohesion, equity, gender, safety, all these issues, mobility, have to be mainstreamed into this um, institutional framework. And uh, taking from Professor Chatterjee, I completely agree with him. I think I would call it vertical integration. Whether it is top down or bottom up is something that we have to decide. It cannot, as I said, be always bottom up, but it has to be participatory. It has to be collaborative. And we have to see how some of the dynamics between state and city, city and its citizens are dealt with more maturely than we have been doing in the past. So that would be my last remark. Thank you. Shruti, if, if you want to add something. I think all that I wanted to say has already been said by my previous speakers. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'll just leave with uh, maybe one point uh, that, you know, municipalities, local governments, they need to understand the cross-cutting nature of uh, disasters and climate resilience and urban development. So uh, what, what they need to do is basically to integrate these concepts in a more, uh, I mean, more than what they're doing right now. And uh, one, of the, one of the major, uh, you know, breakthroughs that cities can actually do or what, what we have seen is that um, 
if we can somehow get these plans, the action plans that are being prepared, if we can get it into the municipal budgets, that helps them to start this integration with urban development and with climate resilience. They, that actually, because they don't really, not always do they have a separate budget for climate resilience, separate budget for environment and so on. But if we can do that linkage and help them to integrate it into their municipal budget. So for instance, if we say that, you know, uh, rainwater harvesting is good for your water resilience and we can actually allocate some budget under uh, the water department for rainwater harvesting, then it automatically lets them spend some money on uh, building more resilience into their uh, systems. So this is just one thing which I would just like to uh, mention at the end. Thank, Thank you. Arvind, your last words, and then probably Arjun will take over. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my last words would be that, like picking the the, the exact case of Delhi, uh, the point that Nivedan mentioned. So so the last plan had a local area plan provision, which meant that you could actually. Uh, do a lot of things in the local uh, at the local level, involve communities and and work with uh, people's groups. This plan, for some reason that is not revealed to us or or anyone, uh, does not have the provision of local area. So what we see is that this is not a question of either or in the sense that we are not saying that this has to be top down, this has to be bo be be bottom up. But we are, what we are seeing uh, or what we are feeling when we look at how planning is being done is that the leave bottom up, the, the spaces of engagement of communities, peoples, uh, and, and vulnerable groups within the planning process of, let's say the cities is very quickly reducing and, and moving away. And smart cities being one very clear example of how it's uh, even furthering away from the, from, the, from the people and their needs. So we feel that this is not a question of either or or we have to say that both of them have to go together and frameworks have to be made where people's participation is encouraged and and ensured uh, that would be my probably last comment thank you thank you so much uh, thank you everyone uh Dr. Nivedita, Devya, Shruti, and Arvind for uh, for for this uh, interesting discussion probably uh, just to lay a foundation of uh, uh, for uh, for more uh, to follow in, in years to come because this year uh, uh, we've seen. I mean, I mean, it's not not that that I just uh, have to mention that data, but uh, you know uh, uh, the, the the challenges are immense, and right from measuring vulnerabilities to actually. Uh, uh, Putting the onus on, I mean, you know, uh, right from community participation, I think all that is uh, extremely important. And then we have some wonderful examples where the community has really come forward and uh, as uh, Arvind pointed out in Delhi, uh, but not to miss the point, you know, Arvind, that state has an imp uh, important role. I mean, Absolutely. Not to ensure that, that the state negates its uh, important role and, and we just reclaim that right of, uh, of uh, ensuring that the state is there for uh, us to function. Um, I think over to you, Arjun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, such a stimulating session today. We extended our time by almost a lot. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for joining today on the occasion of International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. On behalf of IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies, I thank all of you for joining us today on this very uh, pertinent panel discussion on disaster resilient spatial planning perspective on local and regional governance and impact. And uh, I, I would like to thank each one of you, our panelists, Dr. Devya Sharma ma'am, Dr. Nivita Haran ma'am, Prasad Tathagata Chatterjee sir, Vizushrati Sadhu Khan ma'am, and Arvind Dhoni for joining uh, in this very uh, excellent discussion, I would say, very calm also. And thank you so much uh, to our moderator, Tikinda Pawar sir, 
for leading this uh, important deliberation and encouraging us to do so. I would also like to thank those who joined here on YouTube or, uh, or and later watch on YouTube and those who will be watching in Facebook and or listening to our podcast. Thank you all the participants and I wish you all uh, a very nice day and we hope that you tune into our future episodes of uh, Web Policy Talk. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. 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 Thank you.